snatching up a pickup football game somewhere uh, and heading home for dinner, which is what I did at this time of year, and I wish I could. what I would give to play one more game. Anyway, I can't describe how glad I am that I grew up before video games. We didn't have to be driven everywhere by our mother. We only had one car. We liked the independence. And coming up in our second half hour, I'm going to talk to a woman who wrote a piece about helicopter parents, which apparently uh, way too many parents today have become, you know, constantly hovering around their kids. She's discovered a new problem, other people helicoptering around your kids. And her column is what made me think about the line about being glad to have grown up when I did. We'll talk to her uh, up uh, in the second half hour, as I said. We're also going to talk about Hillary Clinton, who's from uh, my generation, by the way, and may also be glad to have grown up when she did, but she's not going to be glad when she sees what Judicial Watch um, has uncovered about her emails. And maybe the email story's been beaten to death. Maybe nobody cares anymore. Maybe you're bored with it, but People should still care about what happened in Benghazi. And Judicial Watch has finally gotten the State Department to release some emails that they've been trying to get for five years. Judicial Watch has been trying to get And they show that Hillary had an illegal mail email server and that she lied about what happened in Benghazi. But who didn't know that? Anyway, it's, I guess, more official now. The media likes to say that it's all been settled and that she did nothing wrong. And as a matter of fact, just a few days ago, the media were saying that the Justice Department found nothing wrong with the thousands of emails that uh, they had inspected, which wasn't true, but that's what was being portrayed in the media. There are still people out there who would like Hillary to run again in 2020, and there are some still uh, who think she could jump in. There's a story on Drudge today about Hillary leaving the door open to 2020 to jump in. Let's hope so, because that would be great for the talk show business, and she would embarrass herself again. But what Judicial Watch has uncovered should finally put an end to her relevancy. Of course, that would require the media covering it, and that probably isn't going to happen. But we'll cover it here when we come back with the lead attorney for Judicial Watch on this case. Stick around. such a sweet, lovable animal, and people would want to pet him, and they'd come up, and they'd get close to him, and it would be this instant, oh, my dad didn't want to touch him. It's like, ooh, get the stinky dog away from me. Even after we'd give her a bath, she would still stink. Very stinky, both bad breath and bad gas. I asked the vet, and he said, some dogs are just stinky. Does your dog itch, scratch? or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E oh. dot com. The omega-3 fatty acids. Flaxseed, zinc, alfalfa. The digestive enzymes that are cooked out of regular dog food. The ingredient to me that it was definitely worth trying. After about a week, he started smelling normal. My husband and I were really kind of astonished. Dynavite is nutrition. 859-428-1000. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. We're living in a very successful, affluent society for many people. Yet, it's also true that there are people that are being left out of that. And how do we reach those people? Joel Gilliam, executive director at Light of Life Rescue Mission. Development to look at the skill gap. Ready to move on. Now they can. ramp for those who are left out. Lightoflife.org slash give. This is Chris Abernath. You don't but administer your estate properly. 
to protect your assets, minimize taxes, and ensure that your inheritance gets to the ones you love. Decide for yourself. Abernethy and Hagerman. Legal help that lasts a lifetime. Visit a-h.law. Hey, Pittsburgh, this is Tony Shilkin for my good friends at Calusi Chevrolet. If you've been thinking about a new car, truck, or crossover, now is the time to visit the team at Calusi. They now have the new 2020 Chevy Equinox in stock. So with select bonus cash and price reductions below the MSRP on select Equinox models, check them out at Calusi.com. Find new roads at Calusi Chevrolet. Homeowners love their Pella windows and doors, and we love how happy we made Sue from Sewickley. It's Susan Wallet. I just have to tell you, this bay window is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> it really is beautiful. Can we install some happiness for you right now? $150 off windows. Or Sokowski and his guests discuss various topics on health and wellness for us and our companion animals as each Saturday live from 9 to 10 in the morning on 1250 a.m. The Answer giving you the opportunity to call in with your questions a healthy pet is a happy pet and being healthy makes people happy tune in listen learn be well the John Steigerwall show a.m. 1250 The Answer so, have you ever wondered why or how um, Hillary Clinton has ever never had to pay a price for what happened in Benghazi on her watch? She and the media would like you to believe that she did nothing wrong and uh, that she's told the truth about it from the beginning. Yesterday, Judicial Watch released some new emails that should require some answers from her and some other people. Whether we ever get them is another story. Ramona Kotka of Judicial Watch joins us now. Thanks for being here, Ramona. Thank you for having me. So what was your role in uncovering these emails? Um, well, I'm one of the attorneys um, on this case for Judicial Watch. Um, we have a Freedom of Information Act case against the State Department. And believe it or not, we've been battling the State Department on this since 2014. So for five years, um, we've been asking for emails in this case. Um, the, the State Department has um, wasn't forthcoming, and finally we get to where we are now, and Judge Lambert, who is presiding over this case in the uh, D.C. Uh, federal court, he granted us discovery, basically permitting us to do a fact-finding um, inquiry with respect to the State Department knew about. Emails that the State Department knew about uh, back in 2014 when Judicial Watch filed the FOIA request and after we filed the lawsuit. And the State Department thought or did not provide it to Judicial Watch because it said it was not responsive. Um, we were in court against the State Department in August, and one of the requests we had, and the judge permitted our request was um, to provide us an unredacted form of the emails that the State Department knew had located in 2014, but said they were not responsive and they didn't need to provide them to Judicial Watch. Finally, we received them only after, actually I should back up and say, the State Department, even after Judge Lambert granted our request, they still refused and moved to compel, um, and until finally, at that point, the State Department released these emails. Um, and basically, these are emails from September of 2012 between um, Secretary Clinton's senior aides, um, Jacob Sullivan and Cheryl Mills, her chief of staff, talking about um, the talking points that were provided to Susan Rice and um, in one of the first Secretary Clinton, this was a conversation I believe that she was going to have with then Senator McCain, I believe. Um, but at that point, um, there it, you can see in this email um, where they're telling Secretary Clinton is uh, advising that first we've been talking, you know, we've we've known else basically say you know providing the excuses as to why. Um, 
that was the administration's position right after the attacks. Um, so this is uh, this is pretty significant in our case. Yes. So, um, I want to get into the whole thing about the uh, the video and everything. Um, yeah. but somebody basically comes up with, "Hey, I know what we can do. Let's blame it on a video." You think it's that simple? That that, and they thought that nobody would ever be able to uncover that. Well, um, you know, I, I don't know what they thought, um, but obviously it wasn't it wasn't truthful. It wasn't honest. Um, they weren't telling the American people the truth, um, and it caught up with them. And then, you know, the reason that Judge Lambert granted all of this to us is was the cover up also of Secretary Clinton's email use to hide information about Benghazi or having to do with Benghazi. Um, and the fact that the State Department knew of this email and didn't give this to Judicial Watch, we would have known this was, this was entirely responsive to Judicial Watch back in 2014. Remember, in 2015, in March, is when the news release came out about Secretary Clinton's um, email use. Mm -hmm. Intentionally covered this up and didn't provide it to Judicial Watch because of Secretary Clinton's private email. Well, here's the thing. Um, two things. I was going to ask you why it took so long, but, I mean, it's just the process that takes that long. But how is it that the State Department is, num is, is able to stonewall for this long? Wow, who, who, I mean, where does the, is there blames somewhere that, beside, aside from the fact that they just don't want to release it, but why are they able to, to get away with that? Uh, and, when, and, and why does it take Judicial Watch, which is a private uh, concern and not a government agency, why does it take Judicial Watch to do this, and why isn't the government doing it? Well, I don't know why the government's not doing it. It should be doing it. And first of all, the government shouldn't have been withholding this information, first of all. Um, why it's taking so long for Judicial Watch? I mean, if that's just process and litigation, unfortunately, and it takes time. Um, and, you know, there was another case that Judicial Watch had in which another uh, federal district court permitted to a feeling that you you uh, at just judicial watch wouldn't be going through all this if you didn't think there was something uh, pretty important to find once you are finished with this job because you don't you don't spend five years looking for something unless you think that you're you're going to find something pretty significant that that's right um, and and this is twofold one is what all, what started all of this was the um, Obama administration's um, Benghazi, uh, the Benghazi attacks, and that it was precipitated by protests of, um, because of a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And that's what started all of this. Um, and it's unbelievable that we are still having to battle them in court. record specifically about talking points provided to Susan Rice before she went on the Sunday morning talking shows. Um, the, the second part of, of this case is the, the lack of, um, <laughs> I, let me uh, put it this way, was there bad faith and the evidence of bad faith by the State Department in processing this request and in responding to Judicial Watch's request having to do with covering up and not wanting to be truthful about Secretary Clinton's email use. And so what was more, what do they, this, uh, this, maybe this is a dumb question, but what do you think the State Department is more um, determined to protect or more worried about uh, being revealed? Her email server or 
the lies about Benghazi because it seems to me the Benghazi stuff would be more damning and more important. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I think it's both at the end of the day. Um, you know, if, if you're covering up or if you're, if you're still hiding information that should have been, um, that should have been released, why, why are you still hiding it? Yeah. And so here's my other question. I mean, you hear the you hear the State Department all the time. Who exactly is the State Department in this case? I mean, are, are we, specific people are we talking about, or is it just this gigantic bureaucracy that this monster with eight hundred heads that you have to deal with, uh, or is it are there a few people that that are able to cause to be able to um, stonewall like this, or does it take the entire department? Um, you know, there are a few actors, obviously, with respect to Secretary Clinton, so her, the actors involved were her um, um, chief of staff and deputy chief of staff and her senior aide. But with respect to processing of this FOIA request, um, um, you know, it's it's the FOIA, some FOIA officials um, who we've had to question um, under oath. Um, and also the attorneys at the State Department who were handling this case. And we've uncovered, um, you know, the reason it's so important is because the government has a duty to be forthcoming and honest to a FOIA requester and to the court. They owe candor and an obligation of honesty to the court. And when, when you violate that that's very that's that's very significant um and the some of the information that we've discovered just this past year um the heads of foia of the foia department at the state department they were already investigating and looking at all the foia requests dealing with secretary clinton's emails back in as early as 2013 wow. that was two years before the news that came out about her email use, and and that's the and that's the State Department officials who, case after case, provided sworn declarations to in cases dealing with Secretary Clinton's emails from the State Department to the court um, and to the federal district court. You know where we are litigating this case. And and that's that's very serious, and it, so that's why this case is twofold: the Benghazi attacks and what the um, government knew and what the State Department knew is is obviously um, very important. But also the State Department's and the Department of Justice officials' candor and actions in this case is also significant, um, because if if we lose trust in the way and um, that they're processing and the information they're providing under oath before the court, um, then there's just no rule of law. And, well, and yeah. Well, I was going to say that, um, you know, since the Mueller report and, and uh, since uh, Trump has become president, um, we hear a lot about the deep state and, and uh, the, the problems of the deep state and what they may be doing there to undermine the president. Um, does this, what's going on here, is is this an example of what the state is or can be or is trying to be? Uh, pro- probably. I, you know, in my opinion, I, th- I think so. Um, you know, you have career officials at the State Department who've been there for a long time, um, and they just, you know, I think that's an example of that. You know, well, some people who, who may not pay real close attention to this and just hear this, you know, popping up in the news every now and then about the emails and maybe are tired of hearing about it. Um, right. And, and they, they may be, uh, people may believe that, well, wait, it's the State Department and Donald Trump is president, so it's his State Department. Why isn't his State Department uh, uh, cooperating? But that's not how it works, is it? No, yeah, I mean, but that's a very fair and a very good question. Um, why does why the State Department? Why we're still having to fight even after Judge Lambert ordered the State Department to provide a copy, an unredacted copy, um, 
of the emails that were given to us that we're talking about, why even after his order, we still had to threaten to go back to the court with a motion to compel before they gave it to us. But these are State Department people who uh, were not appointed uh, and have been and who were around a long time before Donald Trump became president, correct? These, these are not political appointee officials. These are career civil yeah. servants yeah. at the State Department. They've been there a long time. Um, yes. So these, and, these and are, these, yeah. Well, well, that that's that is uh, is that kind of explains why they would be perfectly happy to undermine Donald Trump because he's um, they don't like him, and you know there've been other indications of that from emails and texts and everything else that we've seen. Um, so, uh, well, how do you how do you? I mean, you guys are at Judicial Watch are fighting this, but. Um, what what when what other recourse do you have if this is such an obvious stonewalling attempt that they can continue to get away with it? What would we be doing if you didn't if there if it weren't for a judicial watch? Well, I mean, the recourse we have is to continue fighting fighting them in court, um, and you know, whether it's the State Department or the other agencies. Um, and Freedom of Information Act is a powerful tool, and um, we've been successful. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of work, but that's that's what we Judicial Watch is able to do, and that's what we'll continue doing. We're talking to Ramona Kotka of Judicial Watch. She was the lead attorney on this case. Uh, so, Ramona, if those emails had been turned over way back in 2014, how might that have affected the 2016 election? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think had she come out, um, you know, I, you know that's <laughs> that's hard to say in hindsight how it would have been affected, but... Um, well, she would have had a lot I of think, explaining to do that she hasn't had to do to this point. She sure would have, um, but, you know, she would have had to do it a, do it a lot early, earlier on, um, not in, you know, all the way through October of 2016. And that's been the problem here that we've it's been it's been so difficult to get the information and you get it piece by piece by piece. I have less than a minute left, Ramona. Just real quick, what's next? I mean, what do you expect? What do you hope to have happen next here in this case? Sure. So we actually have a pending request uh, before the judge, um, and he's considering our request to depose Secretary Clinton as well as her. Um, Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills. Um, so we're waiting for Judge Lambert to rule on that. And then we also have um, several depositions lined up through the end of December, um, including other FOIA officials, but also um, the um, some a State Department attorney who was responsible for this case um, and who was also, we have evidence um, that he also was aware of Secretary Clinton's emails um, while he was responding to our case, or well, the State Department was responding to the case. Ramona, <laughs> I'm out of time. Ramona Kotka, okay. Judicial Watch, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Okay, we'll be right back. With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters in Washington. EU lawmakers have voted for a Brexit plan backing by 329 to 299, a bill to implement an agreement British Prime Minister Boris Johnson struck with the EU last week. In a certain way, it is an historic moment because Boris Johnson has got further than Theresa May ever did. I mean, she couldn't even get uh, approval of a so-called meaningful vote to uh, for MPs to back, in principle, the idea of the deal that she had reached with the European Union. Mr. Johnson has now gone very much a stage further, and I think he'll be rather heartened by the result. The second vote went 322 to 308 against the government. European Council President Donald Tusk says he'll recommend that the EU grant Britain's request for a Brexit delay. Down day on Wall Street as the Dow dropped 339 points, the Nasdaq lower by 58. This is SRN News. Sebastian Gorka here. Maybe you've been hearing about Relief Factor, the 100% drug-free supplement that helps a person's body deal with inflammation and pain. You've heard all the wonderful testimonials. Well, I have my own testimonial. For many years, my lower back pain was becoming a serious problem. The short story is... I finally gave it a try, and now I'm out of pain too. So if you're in pain, you can order the three-week quick start for just $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com.
Hi, this is Dennis Prager, and the Prager Store has compiled every male-female hour since 2010. We've had topics and calls about marriage, kids, dating, intimacy, fidelity, plus every segment with my friend and relationship expert, Allison Armstrong. These segments have literally saved marriages. For a limited time, the complete collection, 10 years of male-female hour, 50% off, available on flash drives or as a download, go to PragerStore.com. Mike Gallagher sees another scam from the Democrats. I got an idea. Vote on impeachment. Get get it underway. Vote. And without a vote, nobody from the White House, the State Department, or the Trump administration should be testifying before this kangaroo court. The president is right. It's a scam. The Mike Gallagher Show. Weekdays at 9, right before Dennis Prager at noon on AM 1250. The Answer. Do you or your business have financial problems? Are you overwhelmed with debt? Then call me, Attorney Dennis Spire, at 412-471-7675. My legal practice concentrates on bankruptcy law, debtor rights, and tax matters. I have over 30 years' experience as a former United States Department of Justice bankruptcy attorney and lawyer in private practice. I have represented thousands of cases faced with financial problems and lawsuits. Reorganize and get a fresh start. Call 412-471-7675 or visit my website at DennisSpira.com. If you're worried about market volatility or the possibility of losing money in the next market crash, the time to act is now. Effective financial management involves identifying opportunities. And with a 10-year bull market run, markets around all-time highs, and a highly contested election cycle right around the corner, we have an opportunity now to protect what's important. Don't risk losing a significant portion of your life savings in the next market downturn. Call Hunt & Associates today, 844-366-HUNT. That's 844-366-4868. Community Bank. City Mission. Number one. Mark Stadium. Peters Township Community Center. Angelo's Restaurant. What do all these businesses have in common? Nello Construction. Design and build with one company. Nello Construction. Full service construction from the ground up. Renovation. Expansion. Nello Construction. The choice for business. See the projects. Begin the journey at NelloConstruction.com. Job growth has slowed significantly in greater Pittsburgh in recent months. And while there are myriad factors in the job creation equation, the Allegheny Institute for Public Policy says the usual suspects can be tagged for the region's anemic employment performance. Learn more about this topic at AlleghenyInstitute.org, where conventional public policy thinking has been challenged since 1995. That's AlleghenyInstitute.org. Stuck in traffic? We've got the answer. Watch out for delays on 79. We've got construction ongoing between South Point Boulevard and Bridgeville and also a disabled vehicle on southbound 79 off to the shoulder past South Point Boulevard. Tied up on the parkway east outbound Bates Street to Edgewood Swiss Bail. Inbound slowing down 2nd Avenue to the Fort Pitt Bridge and outbound on the parkway west. Not too bad, but inbound heavy green tree to the Fort Pitt Tunnel. That's a look at traffic. I'm Jenny Robinson. AM 1250, The Answer weather. Tonight it'll turn chillier with partial clearing. Low will be 43. Then tomorrow you'll see skies turn mostly sunny. It'll be breezy and cool with a high of 58. Variable cloudiness tomorrow night with a low of 44. For Thursday you'll see a mix of clouds and sunshine. The afternoon will be nice and milder with a high of 66. With your AccuWeather forecast, I'm meteorologist Frank Strait. This is the John Steigerwald Show on AM 1250. The answer. Well, you've heard of helicopter parents. They're apparently everywhere, unfortunately, which makes me feel bad for the kids because their parents are always hovering around them somewhere. That's bad enough. But what about when somebody else is hovering around your kids? That seems to be catching on, too. Carol Markowitz is a columnist for the New York Post. She wrote a piece for today based on personal experience, and the headline is Stop Helicoptering Other People's Kids. Carol joins us now. Carol, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So um, tell us the horrifying story of you dropping your kids <laughs> off at a movie theater in New York City. That's right. Um, it was in Brooklyn, where we live, and where I also grew up. And I took my nine-year-old daughter, who's very mature, with her best friend, who's also quite mature, um, to go see a, a rated G movie. It was the movie Ab- Abominable. 
Um, and they were asked to leave because they weren't there with the grown up. I had purchased them the tickets, walked them to their seats, put them in their seats, even prepaid their food order because it was a one of those movie theaters where you can order food to your seat. And they were asked to leave because they were too young to be there. Oh, when they asked them to leave, did they? Uh, they were they were nine year old kids. Um, where did they think they were going to go? Did they know you were there to take <laughs> pick them up? Yes. Um, so my daughter called me uh, and told me asked me to pick her up. Uh, she happens to have a cell phone. dropped off at the movie theater with two or three, four friends, you know, at mm -hmm. and on the same street. And if you see mayhem, only about a third of the people were actually watching the movie. And one of the one of the things I remember uh, that I, I can still see it in my mind right now is sitting there, and you used to get the boxes of uh, popcorn that then the f boxes that you could fold and make them flat, and mm -hmm. they would be sailing at the screen. So the entire movie <laughs> it would be not would be noise and bo popcorn boxes flying at the screen, and you know somebody's dad or uh, mother would come and pick you up when it was over, and nobody died, and uh, right. everybody had a good time, and we thought it was that our parents weren't there, and no adults were there, Absolutely. and we were just turned loose, yeah. and the people at the movie theater knew all about it. They were happy to sell us the popcorn and clean up after, sure. you know? So that, that that's a million years ago, but we've come right. a long way, I guess, since then. Yeah, well, what's interesting is that, and I mentioned this in the column, but it, we're living in such a safe time. My daughter grows up in a completely different Brooklyn than the one that I grew up in, which was relatively dangerous, mm -hmm. and the kind of place that had like 500 murders a year. She grows up in a, a Brooklyn that has an extremely low crime rate uh, where really you feel a, a, a sense of safety in the streets that I did not feel as a child. I just, I remember walking around with my grandmother and her just holding her bag in such a way that it could be snatched from her at any moment. And that's just not how we walk around Brooklyn anymore. And, and despite this safety, despite the security, Kids are given so much less freedom now, and the idea of my nine-year-old going to the movies by herself is considered pretty radical. Yeah, and and um, my, my my experience is the sit was was the same in that uh, I, I I never felt unsafe. Uh, but the numbers that are there tell you that the kids are much safer today than they were when I was a kid. Right, and yet parents are much less likely to give them any freedom. And I, I tell other stories in, in the column where I'll, I'll send my six-year-old to another aisle in the supermarket, just, you know, go get me sour cream or something. <laughs> and he will come back and say, oh, that lady told me to go find my grown-up. Um, and it's just the, the this feeling that watching over our kids at every second, and if not the, you know, the metaphorical village steps in to help us, like, I don't need their help. I, keep right. your village off my child is was my concluding line. Yeah, the headline of your story is, uh, or your column is, Stop Helicoptering My Other People's Kids. I, I just have to ask right. you, Carol, would it have been uh, not, um, would it have been not nice for you to tell your kid to go back and tell the lady to mind her own business? <laughs> <laughs> I know he right. wouldn't do that, so, but uh, you wonder sometimes that maybe yeah, that's the way that's to the go, you know? Right. No, I feel like my kids would definitely not deliver that message. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't for, want her for to. For better but... or worse, they, they're, they're taught to respect their elders and not to do that. Right, I know. Um, but I had I had another story in, in the piece that got cut for three kids, nine, six, and three. I'm not a crazy person. I'm not leaving my six and three-year-old at the movie theater. My nine-year-old is, is, again, quite right. mature. Um, but my three-year-old, he's on a scooter, and he's been on a scooter which is like one and a half or two years old, mm -hmm. and he flies down the street, and people inevitably are like, oh, my God, you have to stop him before he gets to the street. And it's like, I know my kids. If I felt that he would go in the street, I would chase him. But the fact that I'm not chasing him means that I know he will stop, and he has stopped 
100% of the time. It's not even a question. And would I trust every kid to do that? No, but I know my kids and I know what I can let them do and what I can't. And you're a stranger on the street and you don't know my kids. So mind your own business. Yeah, so that, I guess maybe the question is, when did when did other people, as you say in your column, the people in the village that's raising us all, when did they decide that they had the right to tell you how to raise your kid and and what right. is what 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 is safe for your kid and what isn't exactly and i, I you know i know that they're just trying to help but mm-hmm. it's not helpful it makes my kids afraid it makes them think that they should be worried and and constantly in a state of fear living in their very secure world so i don't want them to walk around afraid i don't want them to to think that danger lurks around every corner and i have to be holding their hand all the time I want them to grow into competent adults, and part of that is giving them some freedom as children. Yeah. And um, you, I, I, you mentioned that your daughter was when she was seven, when, mm-hmm. when it was walking to go what two doors down the street. Yeah, yeah. So she was walking. Her cousins had just moved to our block, and she was walking just a few doors down. And I was watching her from our doorway because it was one of the very first times that I had given her any kind of freedom like that. And a, a lady walks by her, and they have a, a an interaction, which she later told me, you know, she asked who you is, and my daughter pointed back at me, and the lady comes over to me and says, you can't let her walk around the streets in this day and age by herself. And this day and age is a great day and age. I grew up in a much worse day and age where we had a lot more freedom. Yeah. It's just this idea that we're living in this dangerous time. It's just not true. Well, what? Um, who are kids playing with now if they can only play when they're being supervised or watched by adults? I mean, you can't let them out of the house yeah. at 7 just to go out on the street uh, or, or in the backyard or wherever. Yeah, well, I mean, 7 is... I, I never see 7-year-olds, but I, even 9. I, my daughter now goes to the supermarket for me or she'll, like, you know, it's only like a block away from us. Um, yeah. She'll go pick something up for me. But she's in the extreme minority in our neighborhood, in our, again, extremely safe neighborhood to do stuff like this. Um, when parents hear that I'm letting her have a little freedom, they say, oh, I'd like to do that also with my child. But they, you know, so far I haven't seen a lot of that. Um like when I the movie theater story, I have so many friends now that are saying like, okay, next time you take her, if you send her to the movies, my child will come with her. Maybe once we, we hit critical mass, people will change their minds a little bit and give the kids a little bit more space. We're talking to Carol Markowitz of the New York Post. She wrote a piece called "Stop Heli- Heli- Helicoptering Other People's Kids." You know, I, I'm sure you've seen the stories of parents being. Um, I don't know if they were arrested, but they were investigated yeah. because their kids were seen at the park by themselves. And they weren't right. babies. Or, they were yeah. like kids' kids, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's the the craziness of it. In fact, there was a, a story in New York a few weeks ago. This woman um, sort of, I don't know what happened to her, but she sort of got confused on the train and thought that she had lost her child, her five-year-old or something turned out she had dropped a five-year-old at daycare that's just kind of the side story but when the police arrived at her house and they found a 12-year-old home alone they arrested that mother not for a false charge or something not for a false find time to stay home alone um, they released her shortly after, and they kind of never talked about it again. But it, that was sort of a stunning moment to me, where if 12 is not okay to stay home alone, you know, when is? Well, I, I, maybe you don't know this, uh, but I'd be curious, um, who decides what, what age is okay? And who who picked 12 right. or 11 or whatever, you know, or 13, yeah. whatever? At what age would it have been okay? 14, 15? Yeah, that, well, that's, that's, that's really it. I think that it could be a subjective thing where age, really... Wow, uh, and again, mm-hmm. I, um, I I could tell you I'm, I I grew up in the '50s and '60s, and you know a, a baby boomer, and so every every family, every three or four uh, brothers and sisters, and I'm not exaggerating. Mm-hmm. I, I think I had one yeah. friend who had less than two siblings, three siblings. And He 
He was seven. That's what made me think of it because you you talked about your daughter. She was seven, mm-hmm. and somebody thought it was terrible for her to go two doors down the street. Pat Wallace <laughs> was the kid's name, and he was seven. And I paid him. I made five bucks a week, and I gave him a dollar a week to deliver like fifteen or twenty of my papers. <laughs> he lived two streets away. Walked over from there by himself. Took the ba- bag right. of papers. Walked up the street. Knew which houses to deliver a dollar. And he was one of twelve kids, by the way. So yeah, I mean, uh, and and that's those people grew up to be competent adults, and that's really what we're aiming for here for the kids not to be confused by adulthood when they get there because everybody has done everything for them and held their hands the whole time through their childhood. Yeah, and uh, so do you think we've become a helicopter society, and is it reversible? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that you know we helicopter parents get a lot of criticism, but I think it's very hard not to be a helicopter parent right now. It's very hard to let your kid have freedom when everybody around you is sort of judging you or even like correcting your behavior because of it. And it, and it shows in, in the young adults that we're producing who don't know how to do simple things, who don't understand how to register to vote or, or where to buy a stamp or and all the little things that they don't know how to do because everything has been done for them. And yeah. it's, it's uh, not a good situation for anybody. Talking to Carol Markowitz, finishing up here, uh, Carol, she's with the uh, New York Post columnist. The piece is called Stop Help People's Kids. Another interesting thing I found in there that probably, uh, and this is very strange to me, you wrote that the word adult has become a verb. You want to explain that? <laughs> well, yeah, there's these pieces about how in particular don't know how to adult. You know, I, I don't feel like adulting today. Oh, I... I went to the bank, so I'm over my adulting, you know, thing. you have to do all the all the little things that we take for granted that growing up these kids grow into adults and don't know how to adult, and it's a real problem. Wow, that's scary to me. Well, I, I just wonder what happens when they go to college um, yeah, and well, they show up in a dorm. College. I'm talking about people past college at this point. Oh, oh you're talking about like 26, 27-year-olds, yeah, many of really whom are still living at home. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. Men are still, exactly. still, still living with their parents because the insurance companies have been told they have to insure them till they're 26. <laughs> the, I remember right. when that law was, uh, that's part of Obamacare, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. When I saw that, I thought that only happens because because people refuse to grow up. I mean, there, nobody, yeah. most of my friends were married by the time they were 26. They, they would want, they, the idea of living with your parents at 26, <laughs> you were humiliated. <laughs> You know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's not the same anymore. Now you're on the Netflix account until you're 50, you know? <laughs> well, hey, Carol, I appreciate you being on. Uh, and oh, I wanted one Thank real quick so thing. Much. I got like a minute left, and I saw yeah. when I was looking at your piece. Uh, give me a quick uh, uh, piece on the mindless attack on letting kids have best friends. Apparently, that's a problem now, too. You wrote that, wrote oh, about yeah. that so schools, uh, earlier. Um, schools don't allow, they, they make a, a concerted effort to separate kids who are best friends. If your child shows too much uh, closeness with another child, it almost certainly will not be in the same class with them in the following years because it's simply unfair to the other kids or, you know, it's, they, they don't want to leave anybody out. So best friendships are really discouraged in our schools. Well, that's scary. I just last night I, I met a guy, uh, met some guys at a place, um, and what, the guy's I think seventy years old, over seventy years old, and he just buried his best friend. I mean, these guys yeah. were known to everybody as as two best friends, and he just buried his best. He was with them right up until he died, and he buried them uh, last last week, I think it was, um, and they had known each other since fifth grade. And he's 70 oh, years old. Oh, that's really sad. Then that, and so somebody would discourage that from happening. That's, yeah. Uh, that's we wonderful. Don't want, we don't want that much closeness, I guess. That's sick. Well, hey, uh, Carol, I appreciate you being on. Th- hope to have you on again. Thanks Thank again. you. Thank you. Okay, that's Carol Markowitz, New York Post, and we'll be right back. My baby loved the West on the moon. Yes. My baby loved the West on the moon. Yes. Ooh. 
They blow into town with the wind, rain, and hail. And out-of-town storm chasers going door-to-door, -door, often posing as a local company offering a quick fix to desperate homeowners. If you've had damage to your roof, windows, siding, or gutters and downspouts, you may be eligible to get them replaced or repaired free of charge. Just be careful who you call. Visit WindowsRUsPittsburgh.com for a free inspection from one of their highly trained appraisers. With over 50 years in home remodeling, Windows R Us is the area's premier exterior replacement company for roofs, siding, gutters and downspouts, doors, and of course windows. If damage isn't your issue and you just want something new, you'll love their no-pressure approach, no hidden fees, and one of the fastest turnaround times in the industry. A company who will never skip town when it comes to honoring their warranty. Visit windowsrus.com. Mention Stag for an additional 10% off. Windows R Us, proud sponsor of the Jerk of the Week, heard every Friday on the John Steigerwald Show. windowsruspittsburgh.com. This is Jay Hagerman of Abernathy and Hagerman. Upon your passing, you wouldn't want a judge to decide who raises your children or how your estate gets divided. It is important to review your estate planning documents to ensure they protect what matters most. At Abernathy & Hagerman, we will work with you to establish an estate plan that nominates a guardian for your minor children and that your assets are used for your family's benefit. Judge for yourself. For legal help that lasts a lifetime, visit a-h.law. Pittsburgh homeowners rate Pella number one as a leading window brand. Susan wrote, we are thrilled with our new Pella windows and door. The installation process was superior to any other work we've had done in the past. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Wow, thank you, Susan. Low pressure consultation plus expert installation. At Pella, it's just what we do. Right now, save $150 off windows and $500 off doors or 48 months no interest. Call 888-78-PELLA, PellaPittsburgh.com. You started your business with nothing but a great big idea. They told you it couldn't be done, but that just made you work harder to prove them wrong. Now look at you, ready to take on the world. Speed Pro Pittsburgh South gets where you're coming from when they said they wanted to create great big graphics for great big ideas like yours in less time than anyone else. They were told it couldn't be done. Speed Pro Pittsburgh South just smiled and said, oh yeah, watch us. When you need a large format printing partner who can provide high quality visual graphics in detail, from trade show displays to outdoor signs, 3M brand vehicle wrap for your fleet, to window graphics, banners, and decals. Speed Pro Pittsburgh South can handle most jobs in two days or less, and can roll with last minute change ups without breaking a sweat. Who says it can't be done? For a free quote, visit speedpropghsouth.com. Like the rest of us, you're probably tired of all those annoying sales calls to your home telephone number. Now, there's a solution. Our old Nike robocalls from getting through. Live sales calls will hang up. So how does it work? Call us to your home telephone. greeting. Term contracts, it's still your phone number and remains in directory assistance. The service is only $9.99 per month, and you can eliminate your landline connection and save money. Now, calls to your home phone number can reach any member of the family wherever they are and get rid of those annoying sales calls. OurOldNumber.com. It's just $9.99 per month. Go to OurOldNumber.com to learn how you can get started blocking sales calls today. That's OurOldNumber.com. I'm glad you did. You're listening to The John Steigerwald Show on AM 1250, The Answer. Well, if you're a rap uh, singer, a rap uh, performer, a rap writer, writer of lyrics, you might have a problem in Massachusetts. Uh, a B word within the Commonwealth. And uh, it cost you 150 bucks the first time, and then uh, six months imprisonment, <laughs> the second, and a $200 fine, uh, both if enacted. It would be the only word in the English language to receive such special consideration in Massachusetts. Uh, he said an act, re an act regarding the use of offensive words. Uh, the proposed law would specify that the use of the word B word would uh, satisfy the offensive and disorderly acts of language requirement in existing disorderly conduct, 
Co- uh, co- the word B, uh, directed at another person to accost, annoy, degrade, or demean the other person shall be considered to be a disorderly person, the bill says. A violation of this subsection may be reported to the person to whom the offensive language is directed at or uh, reported by that person or directed to or by any witness to such incident. So if you go to a rap concert, I don't know, there'd be a lot of people being arrested there, wouldn't there? So uh, that's what you got going on in Massachusetts. Be sure you to vote for Democrats so you can put people like this in charge. Please, see you tomorrow. The John Steigerwald Show is a production of AM 1250 The Answer and Salem Media Group. Some window replacement companies offer only one window model that